This is Center Stage, putting your firm in the spotlight by highlighting business owners and other industry experts to help take your firm to the next level. Hey everyone, and welcome to Center Stage. I'm your host, John Henson, and this week we're talking about the future, uh, you know, specifically when it comes to the technology and just all the things that are going to be available to law firms and just to have at, at your disposal. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure you're aware, you, you've heard it before, but, you know, the legal field is typically slow to adopt things like this, you know, but there are just so many opportunities out there that you can utilize to help your firm get ahead of your competitors or even just to make your life easier. I, you know, we, we've talked before, especially in our trends report, just about how lawyers feel like they don't have enough time to do things. Adopting some of this tech can make your life easier and free up a lot of time. And so uh, joining us this week with all of the insight into what the future might hold is the Chief Technology Officer from Assembly Software, Mr. Jim Garrett. Thanks for joining us. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So what is, you know, what is Assembly Software? What do you do uh, over there as part of your job? Sure. So we are a provider of uh, SaaS platform uh, cloud technology in the in the legal space. We uh, provide a, a an advancing innovative platform to uh, uh, primarily we're focused right now in, in uh, the PI legal space, but we play in a lot of spaces. And uh, we have an advancing platform that is very innovative and, and we deliver uh, feature functions so that people can run their law firms, be a little bit more uh, not physically located somewhere, uh, have it all be uh, a platform that's integrating with a bunch of solutions uh, for other things. You know, when you think of things like um, campaign management and sending texts and things like that. So we, we pride ourselves on having a platform that manifests as a case management system, but enables you to integrate all of your other point solutions. Uh, yeah. That's, go ahead. No. Yeah. What I was going to say, you know, is, is one of the things that I, I see a lot of is that a lot of people don't realize just how in depth like software like that is, you know, they have all these different needs, but they don't realize like how much of it integrates. And so, um, you know, to be able to integrate with a lot of different things, even if it's, you know, outside of your platform, but to still have it communicate with each other and, and work better, it does do a lot to make lives easier. No, it really does. And, you know, there's always a point solution that has, you know, planted their flag on something and become an expert at that. And rather than being half-baked on something, sometimes it's better to just partner, bring in a couple of integrations, let somebody who has really embraced that fully be, be the, the point solution of that, yeah. and just make sure it integrates into the workflow. Because, you know, one of the things I was, is, is funny being a, a technology guy, but one of the things I always uh, tell my team is that people actually don't care about their software at all. They just want to do their job. Yeah, And, you know, if our software can enable them doing their job and in fact disappear into their job so much that they can't tell the difference anymore, that that's, that's who we want to be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it, what you said kind of reminded me of something um, we talked about a couple of episodes ago where, um, you know, it, a lot of times like the, the conventional wisdom and philosophy a couple of decades ago was, you know, to not just understand your strengths, but to also work on your weaknesses. Whereas now it's kind of shifting where it's like, maximize your strengths and be aware of your weaknesses and surround yourself with things that, you know, that, that can help out with that, i.e. finding areas where, you know, other people are experts in those weaknesses. And so it's kind of the same thing where it's like, you know, you guys may not do a certain thing, but you have a way to integrate with something that does what, what you need to be done. So, um, all kinds of solutions, you know, it's just, it's just people need to, to just reach out and, and just kind of understand this full scope of everything. It's, it's true. You know, and that, that, that philosophy is great for software. It's great for life. You know, if you're a seven yeah. at something and a three at something, you can work on that three and become a five and that's great. But if you're a seven at something and become a 10 or a nine, people will line up for that. Yep, exactly. So let's kind of start with the the present landscape of, of technology. I mean, what kinds of tech should law firms have adopted already at this point? Sure. Uh, you know, where we are, we, we really should see everybody doing 
some sort of, of case and document management system. And I know that sounds very sort of entry level, but a lot of times, with, and when I say document management, I don't mean having like a shared X drive on your network where everybody dumps their documents and then you go look for a document, right? I, I mean, yeah. a real document management system with, with search context and indexing and case relationships and, and version control and access control and all of those good things. Really, we should be there by now. Um, yeah. You know, if you think about pulling documents together to provide evidence or provide discovery for something, that should be a couple of clicks of a system that's got all of this aggregated and not, you know, not a Dora the Explorer episode where you're trying to find it all. Um, right. So we, we should be there. You know, we should be, uh, everybody should have an intake system at this point that that is based on their software feeding cases and tying into, you know, the marketing campaign of how they got their business so that you know, um, which marketing methods work for you. Um, yeah. I believe, oh, you know, I don't know how many times I can say security, 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 but uh, at the world we live in, if, we, if you don't have, you know, a security uh, operation, automated response, some sort of incident management, if you don't have endpoint controls and hardening, um, you know, it's like the Secret Service always says, you got to be right every time and, and the people attacking only have to be right once. And, um, you know, yeah. if we know anything lately, it's that they don't stop. Yep. And so, you know, that's that's one of the reasons I always uh, advocate for cloud platforms is the democratization of all of the security that you can take advantage of just by living in the cloud. You're, you're never going to have that level of security in your office closet, you know. Yeah. And so really, I would say that is... You know, you should have a good organized document management system. You should have intakes and then and security, security, security. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I One of the things, oddly enough, I've heard pushback on, at least with like the cloud and, and security and stuff like that, almost, almost like as a reason why they haven't adopted it and, and still just prefer to either do everything on paper or, you know, kind of what you said before is just everything's dumped into a, a local file is kind of some ethical concerns about it. And I, I don't even know where those ethical concerns would come from, but I mean, have you heard anything about that or like, or, you know, what, what might even like trigger that kind of pushback? Yeah. I, you know, the, the things that I hear are about worried, worrying more about saying these are privileged documents, these are private and we've got to protect mm -hmm. them. And what I always come back with is you can't protect what's not online and you can't protect what you don't have. Right. And the, the thing that that people miss is that when you move to a cloud provider, you're not giving the world access to your stuff. And I know we see a lot of those, you know, iCloud things that people have leaked and all of that, but understand um, you are responsible for how you play in the cloud, right? The cloud, there's a shared responsibility model. We talk about that a lot is, you know, yeah. we, we use Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure is responsible for the security of the cloud. We are responsible for security in the cloud. And then our customers are responsible for managing their information and access securely. And as long as we check all of those boxes, Microsoft can't read your documents. They can't give them out. Um, yeah. If anybody has ever tried to even find, let alone walk into a Microsoft Azure data center, it's it's impossible. You know, there are really it's, it's military grade security, and when you start thinking along those lines, and then say I've basically got inside of there my own personalized secure vault where only I have the the combination and keys to it, but it's guarded by a virtual Fort Knox. Yeah, it it, it actually resonates more to almost the argument turns into making my point instead of arguing my point because all of the reasons that people more, feel more comfortable staying on premises are the underlying reasons why they would be better off in the cloud. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, kind of a similar comparison is, you know, if, if your office is in this big complex, it's the owner of the complex's responsibility to kind of keep the whole place kind of secure, but it's up to you to keep your own actual office secure with, with everything internally. Yeah, right, right. And you can have the most secure system in the world. And if you go and print out somebody's medical information and, and leave it on a picnic table outside, you know, right. that, that, that's your part to make sure as a user you do. 
But yeah. when you start talking about the the ethical responsibility to protect documents, what I always like to say is, you know, on for instance, your data, if mm -hmm. if we, if you know we have you in the east region of Azure and something happens in the east region, we've got you in three other regions. We've got your data somewhere, and as long as we have it and it's accessible, we can protect it. And it's got all of these uh, you know anti malware things surrounding it because it's always online. Which yeah. you know the average law firm could never spin up themselves. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. So, some sort of case management system, getting <laughs> yeah. on the cloud, absolutely should be what you should have right now. Uh, what What do you kind of see in the in the future, even maybe just in the next couple of years? Yeah. I mean, I think what we're going to see is everything is trending toward the automation of menial tasks, meaning mm -hmm. the law firms. Everybody has runs a business based on what they think their, their strengths are, what you've identified as why somebody would choose you in the market, right? And, and yep. we, that's, that's great. Know who you are, know your strengths, advertise your strengths. What we end up doing is spending a bunch of our staff's time doing um, manual menial tasks that are similar to just administrative work that detracts from the exact reason that we just said we were special because we, we distract those people from doing that. So I think what we're seeing a lot of that's current is just moving toward more automation of these manual tasks. For instance, if you're in a workflow and at this one state of, a, of an intake, you know that you're going to accept it, the, the system can just automatically send a retainer agreement out for, for DocuSign for a signature, things like that, you know, instead of somebody drafting a document. And so I think what we're seeing a lot of is the, the automation of these tasks, and that will continue to where your firm is really focused on what makes you special and customer service. Yeah, absolutely. And and another thing, you know, especially, you know, people my generation and younger, we're more used to interacting with things that are a little bit more automated, even if it's AI or even just kind of how the processes are set up, whether it's an intake form, anything like that. And, and so you kind of get to a point where if you continue to be slow to adopt things like this, you actually run the risk of alienating people because you're asking them to do something that they are not conditioned to do anymore. Oh, it's correct. And, you know, I, I come from a place where I'm one of those people to where if I actually had to pick up a phone to order my food, I would never order food, but I will Uber yeah. Eats all day long. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, and, and yeah. I think that as a society, we're just, we're getting conditioned that way. And it's an asynchronous communication mindset. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, this might, this might seem like an obvious answer, but I mean, you know, how, how does this mindset of, of being early to adopt help, you know, whether it's tech or even some other processes to help other law firms kind of get ahead of their competitors? Well, if you think about embracing that kind of that kind of uh, asynchronous communication and interaction with your customers that we were just talking about and knowing that that is a little bit on the leading edge right now, yeah, this lowers the barrier to entry to expand outside of the reach that you could have normally, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, as we've learned, right, in the past couple of years, everybody is more comfortable finding and engaging businesses entirely over these non-traditional communication methods, right? So that's yeah. just going to keep going. It's going to keep going. You're going to look, these firms are going to be enabled by things like crowdsourced and crowdfunded research instead of a person doing it, the ease of access, you know, these asynchronous conversations where we're communicating over text and email instead of calls. Now, none of these things replace people or an office, right. much like Excel did not replace accountants, right? It gave them another tool and, and enabled them to just change how they work and become more effective and ultimately become more efficient and be able to deliver more services, right? And the flip side of that is like the firm engagement, you know, you're going to be able to uh, leverage social footprints and public information to assess um, you know, whether the merits of any given case, right? All of these democratized sources of data, you can consume to offset the manual efforts, which ultimately, you know, the, the, the point to get to is that ultimately you are freeing up your business to scale by becoming more efficient at the things that are normally constrained by humans and making them not constrained by humans, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of another way 
that that I that I think about it because we've had a couple of people on the show in the past before. It's just you know it helps you stand out in the sense that like you're doing something even you know kind of to the last point like even if people are conditioned to work this way like if you're already adopting this and and people are like like you stand out because people are going to be doing their research they're going to be interacting with multiple firms if your firm is the easiest to work with that's going to give you a big advantage right and you know, I'm very much a, a sort of a Sigma process kind of guy. So I think about cycle times a lot. And, yeah. you know, if it is just that I reach out to the firm, they engage me automatically, even, you know, I hate to say it, even if it's an automated response with a link to click and fill out a form. And I go from being interested in your law firm to on a retainer in an hour. Yeah. I, I mean, you win every time with things like that. Oh, yeah. Especially oh, with, yeah. Our, with our segment of, of the population, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, So I want to kind of switch, you know, actually one other point that I wanted to make, Um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, entrepreneurial minded businesses and, and, you know, kind of looking at it from a a growth angle, because I mean, you, you have this tech, your processes are more efficient, you have more time, you know, so people have, you know, more time to potentially go through casework faster so your firm can be more efficient, which obviously allows you to take on more cases, have higher revenue, you can grow that way. But the alternative side of it, even if you are good with the revenue that you're making right now, all of a sudden you have this tech in place, you're not working as much. You know, your casework, you know, the the time it takes from start to finish on a case can be reduced. And now you have more free time to maybe just enjoy life. Oh, absolutely. I always equate quality of process, quality of system and quality of life. Yeah. Uh, because, the, you know, realistically, it, COVID has proven this out, right? Is yeah. I, I think there was a difference between sort of knee jerk reacting and then working from home versus the paradigm shift of realizing that your law firm is not the building. It is your data. It is your customers and it is your, your staff. And those can all be anywhere. Right. Yeah. So quality of life means, you know, I can work as I am able to work from wherever I am, serve my customers at a high level because we're not constrained by these physical barriers or boundaries anymore. I don't have to go into work to work. So yeah. when you when your customers are geared that way, which we've seen the past couple of years, when your staff is geared that way and your system is enabling access in that manner for your customers and your staff and yourself, your quality of life will improve just by lowering the barrier of what it means to go to work. Yeah. So, so to that point, obviously, you know, remote or hybrid work is really popular right now. I, you know, what does that look like in your opinion for, for legal spaces? Cause I know there was a period at least where even court hearings were virtual for a while. Do you think that's going to become the norm in the future? Or is there going to be some sort of balance in between? I, I do think it'll become more normalized because you know, like we were talking earlier, is generationally, we are just more indexed that way. And as time passes, the, the majority of people that are, are in this age group tend to be indexed more that way. And so I think that will continue. I think where we will ultimately land with this is we're very, very comfortable with virtual meetings. You know, do we want to call that augmented reality or something? Maybe, sure. But, you know, when you have like what we're doing, we're, we're on a Zoom meeting, you know, I yeah. I am as comfortable interacting with you as if we were in an office talking. You know, this yeah. just becomes second nature. And I think what we're going to see is a lot of our interactions will start this way. And then we will look for these uh, physical locations that shift more to not dedicated office space, but more of shared meeting rooms. And we can come together and have a brainstorming session, or you can come together and actually do advocacy and counseling for your customer face-to-face as needed. But I think what you'll see is that the ratio will shift from that being the requirement to that being a choice. And then the physical locations will reflect the fact that we're doing a different kind of in-person meeting. I don't think it'll yeah. ever go away, but it will just change, you know, yeah. and, and making it not a requirement goes back to removing the uh, geo constraints of your firm. You know, it's a lot easier to meet with somebody four hours away like this and, you know, yeah. come together if you need to. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and one other kind of interesting angle in it is, is kind of the mental health side of it. Um, not necessarily in terms of like happiness, but in, in terms of inclusivity, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think 
you know, especially people like on, you know, with autism spectrum disorder, or even, you know, even generalized anxiety or things like that, you know, you talk about people are just as comfortable on a virtual meeting as they are in person. And for people who might have, you know, some, some mental disorders or disabilities like that, you can almost argue that they're more comfortable virtually because they're able to access it from a space where they're comfortable. And, and, you know, and, and I know that like in meetings and stuff, you know, body language and appearance and the background and the environment, all that, it can be part of, you know, steering a conversation and, and, you know, influencing things a certain way. So you take that out and now, you know, everyone's a little bit more comfortable and, and can really focus on the actual thing being discussed. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. And if you think about increasing the access to uh, legal representation and advocacy by exactly what you're saying is there are all kinds of systemic reasons somebody may not be able to go to your office or may not be comfortable going to your yeah. office. And having these uh, virtual slash asynchronous communication methods really, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but it just makes your services available to more people to consume where they are and how they are comfortable doing so, which is as a provider, exactly what you want. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the last things that I wanted to to ask about is just kind of, you know, is, is there anything else that you kind of see on the horizon that like maybe even people don't automatically connect with the legal space right now, but but is still kind of being adopted in other arenas? Yeah, I think I, I think one of the trends we're going to start seeing, this is a little, you know, futurist sort of predictory sort of, you know, take it for what it's worth, but, yeah. uh, you know, not speaking for any of the systems that exist because th that in, tech moves so quickly, right? But yes. you can see the trends of what it represents and what it's supporting. You know, I firmly believe that we're going to see the legal industry specifically over the next, you know, 5, 10, 15 years shift to where the, the democratization of all of this data, the democratization of AI, meaning um, we're going to know everything mm -hmm. about the case, about the surrounding facts, about history, about, you know, ca case sightings, about all of the historic judgments, all of these things as part of accepting a case. Yeah. I, I think what we're going to see is the, the, the legal industry shift more from um, you know, being a, an arguer on behalf of a customer to be an advocator on behalf of a customer within a pre-understood outcome. Because if you think about, um, you know, how insurance claims have changed recently to where if it falls between these lines and you have the supporting data, we're not even going to send an adjuster, here's your settlement. Yeah. And you can, you can go advocate for more. I, I sort of see the legal industry, you know, at least for standard cases, you know, let's not right. get into like high, high touch criminal things and all of that, but right. at least for standard cases, here are all the data artifacts. Here's all the case history. Here's all the outcome. Let's virtually advocate for your customer on whether this is tranche A, B, or C of the predicted mm -hmm. outcome. But we know from everything that this is the outcome that's going to happen. So let's limit the cycle time Yeah, and just start advocating for your customers. And I, I firmly believe that we'll see it shift more from the humans being able to make a case versus the humans being your advocator. Yeah, I, I can, like, even as you're talking, I can see a lot of scenarios like that in, in the family law, estate planning, even like bankruptcy space, um, yeah. where 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 that that would be a really huge shift. Um, yeah, I, I mean, Jim, this has been this has been really enlightening. Uh, you know, how can people uh, get in touch with Assembly and learn more about all the solutions that you guys provide? Uh, assemblysoftware.com. You can go out there, look at our Neos platform. Uh, like I said, we are we pride ourselves on being a platform solution, delivering some cutting edge, advancing technology, and all the stuff we talked about is uh, stuff we think about every day. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, come check us out. We're we're proud to be a technology partner to anybody anybody's interested. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you need more convincing, we have a, a handful of past episodes with other attorneys who have adopted this tech. They talk about how it's changed their efficiencies, how much easier it's made things. And so, um, you know, if you're still on the fence about it, go back and, and find a couple of those episodes and, and, and just kind of listen to that insight. Um, I have a fly in this room. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, last question I have for you. Uh, it's one we ask all of our guests here on center stage. And that is if you had one final piece of advice for our listeners, what would it be? Yeah. I, I always like to, 
I live in technology, so everything is technology to me. And every, is, a system is not a replacement for a process, right? F find what makes you special. Yeah. Ensure that you are able to do that and then build your system to support that and find a system that is configurable and able to be uh, set up to leverage what you decided to make makes your firm special. Makes, and don't expect that installing a new software or picking up a new system or you know in, in grading any technology is going to magically make your process better. Right. Understand how you run to run your business and then configure your systems accordingly. I, I, I just love to start there. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and it, I just had like a mini light bulb moment. It's like, yeah, there's a reason that you know we call them systems and processes, not systems or processes. And right. So, exactly uh, right. Yeah. So that's, that's really great. Jim, thank you so much uh, for coming in, providing the insight. And uh, that's going to do it for us here this week on Center Stage. Thank you for continuing to rate and review the show wherever you're consuming it. Uh, and like I say all the time, you know, continue to send in that feedback, um, you know, what topics you'd like us to consider, uh, anything else that, that you'd like to learn along the way. But that's going to do it. Jim, thanks again. Thank you so much. Have a blast. Thanks for listening. To learn more, go to spotlightbranding.com slash center stage.